Well, thank you, Craig and, and Leslie and the steering committee for inviting me um, here to speak. It's, as Craig said, it's my third time visiting here and it's just a wonderful place to come. So I really appreciate the opportunity to come back. I'm going to talk about GLEON, which stands for Global Lake Ecological Observatory Network. This was, uh, Greg, uh, Craig talked about it a, a little bit, but I'll give a little bit more of an introduction and show you some um, examples of science. But I do want to spend some time talking about GLEON as a virtual scientific organization. And um, the, as we move into, into, the century, into the science that's going to be done in the next several decades, I think we're going to be seeing more and more of this type of larger scale team science, whether it's grassroots or more, um, more prescribed, um, in a way doesn't matter so much, but, it's, but I think there's going to be these larger partnerships and trying to understand how these things form and how they operate and what lessons we can learn um, as we move forward and, and try to do this kind of team science, um, I think is useful. Um, especially for the undergraduate and graduate students here that are going to be actually doing this um, in the next several decades. I want to talk about some specific science results. Um, some of it has to do with tool development. In this case, the tool I'll be talking about is, is actually software rather than hardware. Um, and then two other um, examples that actually were taken from papers that were recently published. One's, one is drivers of variability in lake respiration and the other has to do with um, some lake physics. And then I want to end on, on lessons learned and reflect a little bit about what we've learned over the past eight years when uh, um, we, Gleon was just sort of an idea to where it is now and what this might tell us for, for how to move forward. So I don't need to tell um, you that, that water resources worldwide are under pressure, both in terms of, of water quantity and its distribution, whether there's too much or too little, um, and also water clarity issues. Some of these pictures are just absolutely amazing of, of some of the issues that we face. Over the past 10 to 20 years, sensor technology has been developing rapidly. And so the juxtaposition of these really big water issues worldwide, um, many of which are manifest locally, but it's a worldwide issue, and sensor technology provides us with this opportunity to, um, to see whether we can use that technology to provide some basic science inference that would allow us to address some of the fundamentals of these, of these water issues. And so um, about, uh, actually I think it was in 2000, in the fall of 2003, we first started to get the idea of what would later become GLEON. Um, but the mission statement for GLEON today is, is that um, we conduct, we think we conduct innovative science and the, these next words are important, by sharing and interpreting high resolution sensor data to understand, predict, and communicate, and communicate the role and response of lakes in a changing global environment. So we're about high resolution data, um, we're about doing science, we're about sharing, and we're about communicating. And all of those things are, are equally important. GLEON is actually three networks. Um, foremost, it's, it's a network of people, and I apologize for you GLEONites out here who have heard this about 3,000 times, but, it, but it's actually important. It's, it's a network of people. Um, we have about 400 individual members. Um, most of those are scientists, but not exclusively. Uh, we have members of lake associations um, that are that are members of GLEON. You can see what the growth has been over the last five or six years. They're distributed around the world. Most are based in North America, um, but there is, there is a, a strong um, international um, component, as you would expect with, a, with a, uh, a global network. It's also a network of observatories, and, so, and we have 
something on the order of about 60 lakes um, across six continents, 34 countries. Some of these are streaming data. Some of these have been streaming data ever since the start. Some of them are intermediate. Some of them have aspirations to stream data. Um, so it's a real hodgepodge. Um, but, but again, you can see that there's a, um, a fairly wide international presence with a huge void in Africa. And it's a network of data. And one of the aspects about Gleon is there is this ethos of sharing data. And so it's a, basically an all-volunteer network. I think we have one paid staff member who actually mostly does coordination and organization. The rest is all volunteer. Um, and yet it's tremendously successful because of the ethos of sharing and, and collaboration and just sort of a just do it kind of, kind of feeling. Here are what some of the sensor platforms look like. And you can see that they vary in size and shape and level of sophistication. Um, and they even have some sort of reflection of the culture in which they're embedded. I particularly like the one in, in Taiwan that looks like this nice little thing. That, that was one, actually one of the first Gleon buoys that was put in. And the, the typical instrumentation, um, usually there's, there are some weather variables that are measured above the lake surface. Um, there's um, water temperature that's taken from top to bottom, usually, whether it's by a winch or whether it's by a thermistor chain. There's often a dissolved oxygen sensor, sometimes just at the surface, sometimes at multiple depths. Um, most of our platforms have some sort of way to move the data off of the sensor platform to an internet point of presence, um, but not all. Some, some require actually going and, and downloading data. Um, most packages have at least those, those ones that I've indicated in black. Others um, have measure some sort of light penetration. Some have um, um, fluorometers on them, both for chlorophyll and also for, um, for, for um, colored organic matter. Some measure turbidity, some have pH. And then a very few have sensors for CO2 or, or um, acoustic Doppler for, for understanding water flow, and et, et cetera. It turns out that, that, well, Gleon does not prescribe, and this is actually kind of important for the way we work. Gleon does not prescribe what instruments need to be on a lake to be, to be a member of Gleon. But by happy coincidence, it turns out there are only so many things that you can measure with a sensor. Um, and you know, temperature and oxygen, um, and a few of these things are the common ones. And so virtually every, every one of these buoys has these things anyway. Um, but the, 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 um, the local installations are put out for local purposes by local people. And so um, most typically you don't put a buoy out to become a member of Gleon. You put a buoy out for your own scientific purposes and then see the value added of being a member of Gleon and, and you join. And, 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 and we think there is a lot of value added. So what kind of research questions can you ask with this sort of approach? And it's interesting, this, this slide is, I probably first showed this slide about five years ago, and it really hasn't changed that much. Um, in fact, I haven't changed it at all. Um, role of episodic events, if you think about it, sensors, sensor platforms are really good at, at um, the influence of major storms. In fact, I think, Jen, you're going to talk about um, a hurricane example later on in, in, in this workshop. Um, threshold, nonlinear dynamics. How you can be moving along and then all of a sudden one more incremental change in, in a system changes. Um, talk about the, the dynamics of carbon in systems, whether it's organic carbon or, or inorganic carbon. This has to do largely um, in Gleon with, with what we call lake metabolism, which is, which is sort of a combination of both gross um, or net primary productivity and, and respiration. Um, and trying to understand that process in, in more detail. Um, coupling of physical and chemical processes is clearly something that, that sensors platforms allow you to do um, if you're creative. 
Um, uh, we have a large group in Glion that, that's working on model development. Um, many of these are coupled physical chemical models, but not exclusively so. And one of the things that, that um, Glion excels at is, is doing both site-focused but also comparative um, kinds, of, kinds of research. And I'll show you a couple examples later where, where we're using data from dozens of lakes um, to make inferences that couldn't be made um, from a single lake alone. And of course, because we're, we're, um, we have many platforms around the world, there are large gradients in the kinds of lakes that we have instruments on in terms of size and shape and trophic status and climatic setting and cultural setting. Um, and so that, that really makes it a, a valuable network. How does Glion work? Um, well, remember I mentioned that probably first and foremost it's a people network and so we try to have face-to-face -face meetings um, whenever we can. When we first started Glion, we would have two all-hands meetings each year. Um, and then recently we've gone um, down to, to one per year with, a, with, with intervening member uh, meetings of, of smaller groups. Um, we organize ourselves by working groups, and working groups um, kind of come and go as the, as, the, as the topics come and go, but they're self-organized. Um, and it's, it's an opportunity for small groups of people that share a common interest or share common research question to, to help articulate the question. As Craig said, the questions are probably the most important part. But then also try to, try to um, see what data would be available or could we mount a data collection campaign to, to answer that question. Glion works um, because we have this ethos of, of data sharing. And so um, I think everybody in, in Glion is, is um, very aware of, of the importance of sharing data to the extent possible. Um, and there are some very interesting cultural differences in, in the tradition of, of sharing data um, that we've, that we've um, had to, to deal with and, and work around. But I think at the scientist level, there's, there's um, no hesitation at all to, to share data. I attribute a lot of Gleon's success to the involvement of students. And, um, and I'll show you a, a few slides in a, in a second of how students are involved and what opportunities there are, there are for students. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic supplement um, to, a, to a graduate um, career and, and even and undergraduates are, are involved as well as, as Craig said. And then we've, we've developed a governance structure um, that, that we hope promotes inclusion and, and transparency in, in how we work. And this is always a, a struggle to maintain a grassroots, very bottom-up kind of organization, but also have to have at least a little bit of government so that we can kind of keep tabs on, on what is happening. Here's an example. Um, places where we've had um, all hands meetings um, from 2005 to 2013 and you can see that we've had them all over the world. The very next one is going to be in November in Bahia Blanca, Argentina where Alejandro is from and Leonardo I'm not sure if you're from Bahia Blanca as well or not. Are you from Bahia Blanca as well? No. no. Same country, different city. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> If you're not doing anything in November and want to get involved in Glion, hitch a ride and come on down to Bahia Blanca. So I mentioned student involvement, and this is this is this slide and the next just give you a sense of who comes to these meetings. You can see the very first ones in 2004 or 5. Um, we only had a few members, no students. Um, and this green line depicts the um, percent of the participants in a meeting that, that are students, mostly graduate students, some undergraduate. Actually, I think postdocs are included in that as well. And so somewhere about a quarter to a third of the participants at, at meetings are students. Um, and interestingly, they, they, um, the students are some, of the, are, are some of the leaders. In terms of gender balance, um, we we've, um, 
have been working hard at trying to be more inclusive and you can see we're starting to get the gender balance um, up to about where it, it should be. Um, started out um, dominated by males but now we're getting closer to 50-50 in terms of who shows up at, at meetings. Um, Here are a few examples of the working groups that we have and as I say there are, there are some that, that come and go but um, there's a group that, that is very interested in, in carbon dynamics in lakes, in particular the, the metabolism, the productivity respiration side of it, climate and lake physics. There's a group that is looking at theory um, which largely is a group that's looking at how um, the physical influences on on phytoplankton community structure. Um, signal processing, how, how dynamics at various time scales um, play out. We have a group that's um, dedicated towards information technology and uh, Craig leads the group on, on climate sentinels and there are some other working groups as well. But these are the groups that come together, define what science questions um, they want to work at um, and then go off and, and try to answer those questions and publish papers and make inferences. There are fantastic opportunities for, for graduate students. There's a, actually a Gleon Graduate Student Association that, that Jenny is, going, is one of the leaders of. About 160 student members, um, about 25 to 30 percent of the meeting participants are, are students. There's typically at a meeting, there's a, the first day of the meeting is a student run workshop on whatever it is that the students want to have a workshop on, whether it's um, communicating science to the public or learning more about data analyses or about the hardware. It's completely student run. There are uh, good examples of graduate students um, that have done parts of their dissertations on Gleon projects and I've just shown three here. Um, Ashley did a really nice project on microbial community structure. Um, Nathan looked at carbon dynamics in reservoirs worldwide, a mass, one of the, the largest data sets on, on reservoirs. And, and uh, Kaylin published a really nice article in Science on, on uh, nutrient um, limitation and the management uh, implications of that in, in lakes. Um, so that, and there's lots, so there's lots of opportunities for, for this type of thing. It's, it's typically that a student wouldn't have their entire dissertation be on Gleon, but often it it's acts as, as a supplement. There might be a chapter or, or two chapters that are they're involved in the, in the network. Glean also provides a lot of professional development opportunities for, for students. Um, students have been involved in helping to co-host the, the all hands meeting and what an education that is to, to figure out how to actually um, host a meeting. Um, students have organized scientific sessions at large meetings like, like the Ecological Society of America or, or ASLO. Um, they're on our steering committees. Um, so they're directly involved in governance. Some of the students have been leaders of the network science um, and so are first authors on some of these prominent papers that have, have been coming out which I think is, is way cool. Um, and, and students have, turns out that the public loves students and um, so in many ways the students are the best advocates um, we have in the interface between, between Gleon and, and the public. Okay, so what have we actually learned? Um, what have we actually done? And I'm going to give three examples. Um, the first is going to be really short because Luke is going to talk about it in more detail um, about a tool and then I'm going to talk about um, two others, one on respiration and one on lake physics. Um, the, the tool is, is, um, is called Lake Analyzer and basically what it allows is for if you have a lot of the, the physical data that these sensor platforms would measure, can you um, use these data to compute a number of uh, really useful physical indices of, of, of lakes and in a way that is um, pretty straightforward and, and robust um, and more or less user friendly. 
And, and the answer is, is yes, you, you can do that. And Lake Analyzer has become sort of a standard tool that um, many of our projects are using um, as, they, as they develop their analyses. The, the um, development of that, this was, was kind of interesting, and it, and it sort of illustrates how Gleon works. At our fifth Gleon meeting, which was probably in 2007 or something, um, the idea was spawned. Um, wouldn't it be cool to have such a thing? About a year later, um, there was a graduate student that, that kind of took up the charge and said, yeah, you know, we've been talking about it. I actually want to do this. Uh, we mocked it up, um, put out a beta version. These, are all, these steps are all about a year apart. Um, and then it was published. And the, the lead author is, is, uh, was a graduate student at the time of the, of the publication. And so you can see it's, a, it's a, um, a process that kind of percolates slowly, but there's continuous progress that's made. Um, involves a lot of people and leads to, leads to really nice um, science results. And, and Luke is going to talk a lot more about Lake Analyzer and actually lead a tutorial on how to use it. Right, there you are. And that's coming up tomorrow. So two science examples. Um, both of these were recently published. This first one, Chris Solomon uh, is the, the lead author. He's at McGill. He was a postdoc at um, University of Wisconsin-Madison when, uh, when the project was, was launched. And you can see there's a whole host of authors. Um, and that reflects not only the data contributions, but the intellectual contributions to, to the paper. So, so again, it's, it's team science. Basically, um, what, what Chris was asking is, is what drives variability in, in respiration, um, respiration rates in lakes. And you can use um, the high frequency dissolved oxygen data along with water temperature data to compute the amount of gross primary productivity and respiration in lakes simply by looking at oxygen temp tends to increase during the day due to photosynthesis, tends to decrease at night when photosynthesis shuts off, but respiration continues. So oxygen is net consumed at night, um, net produced in the lake during the day. If you account for flux to the atmosphere and a few other things, you can actually back out the amount of gross primary productivity and respiration. What, what Chris did was take this a step forward, and he used um, maximum likelihood estimator as a statistical technique and bootstrapping to compute daily estimates of, of respiration, plus put statistical uncertainty around the measurements on a daily basis. So this is the one of the first times we've had this uncertainty on the daily estimates. We had seen that there, previously that there were large swings in, in respiration from one day to the next, and we had always assumed that this was just statistical noise and, and problems with the, with the measurement. And, and basically what he did is to say, okay, now that we have um, air bars associated um, with these measurements, is this day-to-day -day variation real um, or not? And which lakes have more variation, which lakes have, have less? How coupled is this to gross primary, primary productivity and, and so on? So he, he looked at this from 25 lakes all across the Gleon network. Um, here's, here are two examples. These are respira daily respiration values with the air bars um, from two lakes, one in, in Ireland, one in, in the US. Um, and what he found was that somewhere between 5 and 50 percent of day pairs um, had statistically significant differences in, in respiration. Median was about 15 percent. Um, so almost, almost um, one in five days, um, you might expect the next day to be, have a statistically different amount of, of respiration, which is really weird. Um, it's, it's how do you account for that? Um, and, and, you know, one of the answers is, well, there are, they're all, there, you would expect there to be differences in gross primary productivity, say, based on, based on sunlight, cloudy day versus, versus sunny day, and so on. 
But this is, um, this is one of the first papers, this is the first paper to show that, that some of this variability is, is real. Lakes that are smaller tend to have um, more adjacent days that are statistically different than lakes that are larger. Um, and that could be for two reasons. One is that smaller lakes are just more variable, um, but also that larger lakes, the uncertainty in the measurements is larger. And a little bit of both of those is, is going on. Um, so, but, but using this statistical technique, he's, he's been able to open up this world of, of looking at respiration. The next thing he did, now that he had daily estimates of respiration, he also had daily estimates of gross primary production that came along with this. Um, he fit a model to ask how much of the daily respiration can be accounted for by the daily estimate of gross primary production. Um, so that would be kind of, so you just do a regression and you do a slope of, of the slope term is, is to what degree is respiration dependent upon primary production. But there's also an intercept associated with that regression. And so that would be in the absence of any primary <coughs> pr production, how much respiration would be occurring. And both of those parameters are really interesting. So what I've, what I've plotted on the vertical is the slope parameter, the amount of respiration that occurs per unit of gross primary productivity. And the one line would be, you know, if every bit of productivity was respired um, each day. And here I've plotted what the total phosphorus concentration in the lakes um, was. And what you can see is that, um, is that there's a really tight relationship between primary productivity and respiration in lakes that tend to be of lower nutrient status. But once you get up to a eutrophic status, um, there's more production that's occurring than, than is being respired. And this had been hinted at at the literature, in the literature, um, but Chris was able to show this um, really definitively with a really large data set. So that's the slope parameter. That's the dependence of respiration on on primary productivity. But what about baseline respiration? If primary productivity were zero, what would the respiration be? And that's what I plotted here. It's the background respiration. Um, and versus a measure of allochthony, how much material is coming in from outside of the lake. And so the index here is watershed area per unit lake volume. So the idea being that if you have a small lake in a very large watershed, you would expect a pretty significant amount of material coming into that lake um, from the watershed. Whereas if you had a very large lake in a very water, small watershed, you'd, you'd expect just the opposite. You might expect that as the watershed influence increases, the amount of background respiration would also increase because you, you, have a, you could have a fair bit of, of um, organic carbon coming into the lake that is available for, for respiration. And in fact, that's what, um, that's what Chris found. So that, um, so that respiration tends to increase with watershed influence or the amount of, of a lock that is loading um, to lakes. So again, a very large data set, very powerful, um, and a very strong inference. Daily respiration um, is real. Um, which is really interesting result. Tightly coupled to GPP in low nutrient lakes, less so in, in um, higher nutrient lakes and, re and background respiration um, is a function of, of uh, a lock that is loading. Really fundamental, important stuff. The next example I wanna show has to do with lake physics. And this was led um, by Jordan Reed, who's now with the USGS, but he was a graduate student at the time that he led this project. So we had a postdoc leading the one before, we had a graduate student leading this other one. And again, it's the host of, of authors. Um, John Lentris is in the room is, is on this. Kevin Rose, who is on the steering committee is on this. Luke, you must be on, are you on it? Uh, no, not on this one. <laughs> anyway, a whole bunch of people on it. Um, basically the question was in a lake, you have this upper mixed layer. And what causes, um, what causes that mixing? Wind certainly is a major driver of, of the mixing, but you can also have 
this phenomenon where as the air temperature cools at night, the very surface waters of the lake also cool and sink. And so you can get this convective mixing that occurs. And the question is, how important um, are both of those factors um, in, in causing the upper mixed layer to, um, to mix? So wind shear and buoyancy flux are, wind shear is the wind cost, and the buoyancy flux is this convective cooling um, that often happens at, at night. He, um, he took data from, he and a whole bunch of colleagues took data from about 40 Gleon lakes, so huge data set. He tells me over 24 million observations. Um, that's a lot of data coming from, from these platforms on lakes all over the world. And what he did was um, he was able to, um, to compute the amount of mixing that was due to the wind and the amount of mixing that was due to the convective cooling um, because of all of the, the data that came along with just the water temperature data. Um, he, had, he had the meteorological data and, and so on. So here um, I'm showing um, about a week's worth of data. This is a, a lake in Wisconsin, but it's just one of the study lakes. And this is the, the amount of, of wind shear, how, how much the wind is acting to, to mix the lake. Um, and you can see that these hash marks, well, these are night, day, night, day, night, day, night, day. So the amount of, of wind mixing goes down at night when, when the wind tends to, to, to die, die down. If you add to that the, um, the amount of mixing due to convective cooling, you see that in blue. Um, and for this particular lake, um, the numbers tend to be a little bit higher, um, but the peaks occur at night when the wind shear is low, lower during the day, night, day, night, day. So it's, so it's offset. Um, if, you, if you scale this up across a year and then you scale it across 40 lakes, um, you get this, this nice summary graph that, that Jordan put together, which shows surface area. So each one of these data points is a lake and the actual data point is the outline of the lake. Um, scaled so that it looks like they're all the same surface area, but they're actually not. They, they vary by about six orders of magnitude in size. So a one hectare lake would be here, 10 hectares, 100 hectares. Um, and what, he, what we plotted on the vertical was the ratio of the wind shear coefficient to the convective cooling coefficient. And for reasons I don't completely understand, the 0.75 value is where they have equal influence. So this bar, if a lake falls along this bar, the mixing is caused equally by convective cooling versus, um, versus wind shear. And what you can see really clearly is, as you might expect, in smaller lakes, the convective cooling really predominates. In larger lakes, the wind shear predominates. But even in lakes that are pretty large, something like 20 to 25% of the turbulence in, in the upper mixed layers is caused by convective cooling. And this is really important because um, if you're interested in gas flux across the atmosphere um, lake boundary, knowing um, what causes the turbulence is, is really important. So that's a really cool result. Um, both wind and convection are important. Balance varies with, with lake size. And you know, so here's also a functional definition of what a small lake is. A small lake is one that's dominated by, by um, mixing is not dominated by wind. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, lessons learned. Uh, so this is time to reflect a little bit on what we've learned um, from Gleon, where we started as just an idea um, sitting around as you would have at a bar. Um, a few of us going, uh, you know, we've had some buoys in Wisconsin. We just put a buoy in for a purpose in, in Taiwan. It was really fun. Um, what's to stop us from doing this at a large scale? And the answer was, well, we're the only ones that are stopping us from doing this. Um, so it turns out, so, you know, sit around, you catch an idea, you make yourself a website, and you declare that, that you exist. And, uh, 
and with a few more machinations, you get some funding and, and, you, and you say, I wonder if anybody would be interested in this. And so you start holding meetings. People come and you ask, why did you come to this meeting? Oh, because it's really cool. I, you know, I'm all, I like to share, I like to collaborate. You know, I have my little lake, but I'd really like, and, and, and it grows. So what do we learn? Um, you know, and this, some of this seems like really duh, you know, pretty obvious, but it wasn't obvious at the time that we, that we did this. Um, scientific networks are, are people networks. It's, it's sort of about the data and it's a sort of about the hardware and it's sort of about the questions. Um, but if you don't get the people part right, um, you're just not going to go anywhere. And so, you know, being inclusive, um, looking after diversity issues, um, providing opportunities for students. These are all really critical um, to having this sort of collaborative um, network. One of the things that we did after about the fifth or sixth meeting is we said, um, you know, we really ought to survey the people that come to these meetings to see what they think, you know, because we think the meetings are going great. And so we did a survey. It was after the Florida meeting. And, uh, you know, and you kind of do this expecting to, to get really good feedback, you know, and, and we got this feedback and it said, you know, my voice wasn't heard. I w there, were no, there were no women up at the front of the room. Students weren't, weren't involved. Um, you know, the discussions um, weren't at a, a level that I could understand. And it was like, oh, what are we doing wrong with this? And there were some good things as well. And so we started to attend to what was, what was happening. And we actually formed a committee that we call a Collaborative Climate Committee, which has nothing to do with climate like how hot or cold it is. It has to do with what is the collaborative environment of our organization. Um, and that has been sort of an, a, an advisory group, an independent ombudsman, is that how you say that, to the organization, which was really provides really important feedback for us. And so we've sort of evolved into, into um, in a sense, a learning organization where we try to see how we're doing and reinvent and, and adapt. Um, so that's, you know, that's a real opportunity to learn how to do this and the challenge is how to maintain this. Um, we've had some success. How do you maintain success? It's really an interesting challenge. The other thing that, that blew me away was that, and this again, you know, why, why should this be a surprise? But scientists around the world are eager to collaborate. Um, they're, people, they're really interested in, in, in collaborating. And so we attract um, people with all kinds of expertise um, to this. And so, so we've grown. We, we grew from you know, just a few people to over 400 members, 60 sites. You know, all. How do you manage that? so that you don't lose the very thing that attracted people to, to Gleon in the, in the first place. That's a, that's a, a huge challenge. Students turn out to be critical. You know, and, and again, why should this be a surprise? But um, as soon as we started involving students in a more central role, allowing for leadership opportunities, allowing for true inclusion, um, the network blossomed. Um, and that's partly um, just the energy that, that, the, that the, the, the students bring. It's just fantastic. Um, when I went to school, Craig, you probably had the same experience. Um, we were never taught how to do collaborative science. You know, there were no courses in how you do collaborative science. And so how, you know, how do you? It, and well, it turns out that there is a developing field that's basically the science of team science where there are people that actually study what makes collaborative networks work or, n or not work. Um, and so there are models of, of where we actually have a cohort of students that are going through this sort of training with people that actually know about this stuff, uh, which, is, which is really cool. The public is, e is really eager to engage, um, but, you, but you have to be able to put the local science, the local lake, into a global into this global context. They, it's, um, the people really enjoy to see how the lake that they're interested in fits into this global picture. Um, so that's, that's really neat. There's real opportunities for engaging with, 
with the public. And this is, this is all over the world where we're, we're finding this. Data sharing is, um, is um, takes long-term effort and, and you can have all of the willingness in the world to share data, but, but there's technical stuff um, that needs to happen in order to, to share data. And it shouldn't be underestimated how much work that that takes um, in terms of, of quality assurance and in terms of getting data in the same um, structure so that it's easily discovered or it's easily shared. Um, and we're still struggling with this and, and how best to do this. We've gone through a, a number of models. And then the final lesson um, has to do with, with um, the evolution of the network. And so what I've done here is just plotted the number of publications that in, actually I, in, in a few of our estimations would not have happened in the absence of Gleon. And you know, that's a very qualitative um, thing. And, we, and we, we looked at them from how many of these um, were data, data publications that used data rather than just being a conceptual um, paper. How many of them had data just from one site? How many of them had data from more than one site? And you can see when we started, you know, there were just a few papers that were coming out each year. Of those that were data papers, most of them just had data from a single site. And then we get out to 2011, 2012, and I haven't plotted 2013. You start to see um, a few of these multiple site papers starting to be published. Um, which, in my view, is, is evidence of a, of a real network where Gleon is going beyond what a single site could do to what a network of sites can do. Um, but interestingly, it took us something like six or seven years to, to get there. And there's, there's something to, there, I think there's a real lesson here in terms of, of how long it takes for an organization like this to kind of come into its own and, and begin to mature. And it's a lesson that, in my view, funding agencies need to hear because, because the typical funding blocks are this long. You know, and it takes, it takes sustained effort to, um, to get to where you can really realize the potential. And I think that's the last slide other than saying that Gleon is the best thing that's ever happened. So. Thank you. All right. Uh, we, have, we have time for questions. If anyone has some questions for Tim. Tim, where do you see Gleon in the next 10 years? So the question is, where do, you, where do I see Gleon in the next 10 years? And uh, if... Uh, I'm notoriously bad at, well, at making those sorts of predictions, um, but but I see I see Gleon as um, as as being um, successful in raising private money um, to allow it to flourish in terms of the nuts and bolts part of the organization. Um, and I see it becoming so in a sense becoming less dependent up from the typical funding agencies in order to, to hold the organization together. Um, we'll still need those, that sort of funding to actually do science, but in, but in terms of, of that sort of glue. I see us continuing to grow, but probably not at the rate that we've grown over the first decade, first less than a decade. Um, and I see us moving into areas of the world um, where we just have not um, been able to have any kind of impact. I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if maybe towards the latter end of the next 10 years, um, we start to have a much bigger presence in Africa. Um, but that is a, that's, that's a real tough one. I think in terms of the, the sites that are already flourishing, some will, some will persist, others will go as either funding for the local sites um, goes through its normal fits and starts, or the key people move on either through retirement or, or having other interests. So I think there'll be that sort of continual um, evolution. Um, 
there'll be some growth. I think the, the types of science questions that we're going to be able to, to answer are going to, be, are going to continue to be more multi-site. I think there's going to be much tighter coupling between um, the modelers and the empiricists, um, where that's, that's going to be a more seamless integration. And I would like to say that we'll finally get on top of the um, data technology issues in terms of being able to share data much more effectively than, than we're able to do now. Just because right now it's, we're still relying on people to send data files around, yes, as you know. We've made great progress in that. And Luke, you were, the, you were championing that. But we have a ways to go with that. It's a, it's a really difficult problem.